Um, all right, so we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so uh, this is the first time we've done like a smaller workshop setting, we usually do the bigger one. So uh, we'll try this. I think one of the parts in a, um, in a smaller one is that hopefully this can be a little bit more interactive. The, the goal is designed to really get into some of the nuts and bolts on this. So uh, the, the, you know, I should probably share my screen real quick. Um, So I have a, you can kind of see a, flash, a snapshot of some slides I have here. Uh, I gave a preview yesterday, but, but the, the, the whole discussion is turning on staff meetings. How, how do you turn the dial from a more, you know, the emphasis being on the boss, the emphasis being, you know, to kind of one um, more towards the community. Um, so this is what we're going to show you today. We're going to start actually with going around the room. I'd like to get a sense when you think of, we're talking about, more of you know 15 10 to 15 and higher so kind of what John said there from the uh, you know his side things like the uh, all you know his all khaki meeting um, his all hands meeting different ones have ones we're not going to be talking about at least here kind of smaller meetings eight person ten person down to four meetings and two two meetings um, there's a place for that questions come up at the end we have a little time I'm, I'm happy to you know, share with you some of the things uh, that I think we've found that work there. Um, so what, what we have is kind of five parts. Why meetings are important, and get into that. How meetings go wrong. Um, I was gonna walk you through the origins for us. I think one of the challenges, I think when, I heard a little bit with John, when teams get started, I had a long conversation with, uh, with Jason and his team last night. Um, when, I, I think sometimes you come to next up, you see some of these rituals, and they're like, we're way down the, the chain. So it was even fun for us to go back and look at the origins of our staff meeting. I used to be the, I love Jason's language, so Jason's the, the kind of chief of staff for uh, ACCLW, a, a wing in the aviation side. Um, and he called it, a, he plays the role of traffic cop. Uh, I was a traffic cop, so if Charlie was the boss back then, I was a traffic cop to make sure everyone got their slides together, everyone was there. All things are orderly, so um, I know the pain of, and, and it really went through a lot of pain transitioning us to where we are today. Um, that took us about ten years, um, so I hope through this uh, we can do this a lot faster. And we know we can, um, if we, but, but I share that with you. It is a process. Um, I, and, I think you know the other thing that's happened at Next Jump. So yeah, like Greg, we've been here for twenty years. I mean, when we started, it was definitely like standard issue. We just had meetings all day long, meeting after meeting after meeting. Like inspect, inspect, inspect. The occasional inspiration meeting we're running. But that's, you know, that's how people run. We have very few meetings now. Like if you look at my calendar, we actually went back our calendars like 10 years ago. It was like, you know, it's just solid block of blue of meetings. And now we, we it's almost open because so much of the decision making is happening at a lower level that we just don't, don't need as much, we don't need as many meetings. So that's the objective. Okay. Over, over totally. Totally. And so then we'll touch and we'll end with kind of getting started. And hopefully this can be interactive. So, so certainly hop with, with questions. So maybe to start, if we don't mind. Uh, yeah, go ahead. One question. Yeah. You said. So that means if you look down the line, other people are having meetings, but they're a smaller group meeting mm -hmm. rather than you folks have. It's a much closer to the work. So they would say they have lots of meetings. Um, I would a lot less than they used to because think about before we'd have meetings, but oftentimes we'd have meetings and we'd invite our team to it. So, you know, if you think about meetings, oftentimes at the core, there are a lot of different reasons for meetings. You want to you know, inspire, you want to kind of, you know, a lot of it's tactical. What, what are the parts that we need to get done so we can have a discussion? Mm -hmm. There's a sense making component of it. What's, what is relevant information that I need so that we can make a, a decision as a, as a because I would argue that most organizations traditionally we use the elephant cheetah model have been set up so that the decision making is really at the top. Meetings traditionally been set so the group will come in to give kind of information, tactical parts, sense making so that the top can make better decisions. So there's a few things going on. One, things are changing so fast that no longer can the boss be making all the decisions or certainly not the most effective. Um, two, 
that has forced a change in terms of the dynamics and more information down faster and faster. So I would argue it's almost forced more meetings so people can get more information to sense make so they can make more decisions, which has resulted in uh, you know, more work. So no one here from AAA, so we, we've done work with AAA, a successful company, awesome company. I know their executives, they literally have eight hours of meetings a day. Pharma, it's four and a half hours per meetings per day on average. So it's a huge investment. That's one of the things I think that's going on. The other part that's going on that's based on an assumption is that oftentimes there's an assumption that I'm getting the relevant information in this meeting, right? So that's, as we all know as leaders, it's not always the case. So part of what we're gonna be talking about even in our journey is how do you build like more kind of truth and there's lots of ways to go about this, not just the meeting. There's how do you build authenticity? How do you build honest conversations? How do you build feedback loops? How do you have, and you know, I, I don't know, but like a lot of meetings, it'll be one John references as well. It's the loudest person that has the courage to speak up to the boss. And there are four, you guys probably heard Henry yesterday, he's on our team, give us 10X. Henry won't say a word in meetings. Yet his point of view is valid. How do you get the Henrys of the world to be able to kind of speak up? You know, that, that's really hard. And so from a sense making standpoint, when Tom and our leaders in our setting, you know, th I've had challenges in the past where I listen to my loudest people. I'm not getting the sense making from him. And that has been an example of like some really consequential decisions. So before I fully dive in though, just because it's smaller, if you don't mind, we just by team. So if, if could you go around with your team? What, what, what do you come to mind of just 30 seconds on your kind of team meeting, your staff meeting, your version of this larger kind of meeting? You know, what's it like today? How often? A, a little bit of details about it. You mind? Okay, sure. so, just, so just say your organization yeah. and then. Okay. So Gretchen and I are with Harvard Chine. Um, and what first comes to mind is the organizational silence, a few people speaking up. And, uh, and not uh, a discussion in terms of making decisions as a group. It's just and how, big, how big is the meeting? And about 10 people. Yeah, we have to, we, we, we're going to have to scale down from okay. what you so talked to 10 today. Because our team is 10. So 10 people so, and, and how often, maybe it's like size and how often you hold them? Every two weeks. Every, every two weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And is it, would you say it's kind of king? Pastor style, like a, a kind of a boss of the energy? Is it a more collaborative? It's supposed to be more collaborative, but it's designed to be more collaborative, but it, there's a lot of silence. So just a okay. few speak, not one, but a few. Okay. And it's in, you know, we're talking military settings, we're talking corporate settings. This is an academic setting. So we have this interesting mix of the pecking order in terms of the PhDs at different levels and then those that don't have the PhDs but might have broader spectrum experience in other directions. So it's it's building through that too. Okay. Beth Westbrook, I'm from Grant Thornton, which is a public accounting firm. I'm on our marketing team, our monthly meetings are about 100 people and it's definitely- How many people? Session, about 100. 100 people, okay. Um, it includes an Indus team. Um, definitely more short and throw up, um, not a lot of interaction. People are, are afraid to speak up on those particular meetings. Yeah. Um, and then our, I think our staff meetings are more effective. It's a smaller group. Um, when we get my leadership team together, um, there are about 10 of us on those calls, eight to 10, depending on the call. Yeah. And, and those are pretty effective. Everybody speaks up. We're, we're like pretty raw with each other, I would say. Okay. But once it gets bigger, nobody. Nobody says anything. Okay. Uh, Dennis Williams, um, Smith Technology. Can, can you and your, can you guys hear on the, on the phone? Is it? Yeah, okay. okay. I'll speak louder. Is that better? You're good. You're good. Okay. Um, we've got about a, a weekly senior executive staff meeting, in which there are 10 of us. I'm, I rotate chairing the meeting with a colleague. Um, I personally hold a department staff meeting once a week as a way of sharing with my team key items that are um, that are discussed at executive staff as well as initiatives that we're looking at doing as far as improving the quality of what we do in software development and testing. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I chair that one and one week is supervisors and managers and another one is just the managers. And so that particular meeting will probably be 
the supervisors and scrum masters, probably about 40 people. We also have a meeting that I don't chair, but um, that we have um, once a month, um, which is called the um, product management meeting, in which they talk about the products and the direction it's going and the profitability. And another one as relates to the roadmap, as far as where they're taking their individual products, our company has probably a total of 69 products. So um, these two meetings we do once a month, and in those meetings, each product manager has a 20 minute segment in which they're presenting about the product. And a bit again, I don't chair that, but that's that's probably just kind of a big over, overview okay. of kind of key, yep. key meetings in our organization. Okay. Hi, Lena Frank. Um, I'm the deputy group commander for Maintenance Group. Um, we are building um, at Adelson Air Force Base, and we are building to 1,200 people and three fighter squadrons with 75 airplanes. And meetings that we have, and I'll just go at the, the maintenance group level, are we have two daily production meetings, and that's very tactical in what was flying the day before, what we're flying today, what we're flying tomorrow, and setting the priorities across the entire maintenance group. The next set of meetings that we have are more administrative, and that's the weekly staff meeting, and that's where you're at with stuff that's all administrative, what we call all administrative, from um, performance reports, things that are scheduled, admin schedule stuff. Um, scheduling meetings is a whole different event, and that is how we synchronize the ops and maintenance uh, utilization of the aircraft over a longer term. So we have shared resources, we have between ops and maintenance. And if you've ever been around anybody in the Air Force, everybody laughs at how many meetings that maintenance has because we are meetings all day long. And then we've got meetings um, at our lower levels to prepare for group meetings. So when I was a captain, I went to meetings from 6.30 in the morning to about 5 o'clock at night. And then you did your work in the evenings or on the weekends because yeah. you were in meetings all day. So this very much interests me on how we look at reducing that. Yeah. Uh, Jason Fox, ACC Logwing, Chief Staff Officer. Uh, so we're in charge of all the E2 Hawkeye squadrons and C2 COD squadrons in the Navy. Um, and uh, so the big meetings that we have, uh, 20 to 30 people, uh, three times a week, uh, 45 minutes at a, at, a, at a pop, Monday, Tuesday, Friday. Um, and there's only one that the King, the, the Commodore actually attends, and that's Tuesday. So the Monday and Friday are more intended for the staff to collaborate. Although it's not functioning that way, but that's the intent. And then Tuesday is to brief the boss. Um, and uh, so we're struggling uh, with uh, trying to figure out how to streamline those, uh, reduce them, uh, and get them to a, a manageable uh, uh, level. There's thousands of other meetings that happen on top of that. Those are the three that I would call staff meetings of, yep. that we're going to function on, uh, focus on here. Uh, I'm Randy Kenzie. I'm the Inspector General at Isles Air Force Base. Really, what my responsibilities are: do all the inspections for all the units for compliance and whatnot on the base. And really, I have a small team, about eight total people. And so, I, I kind of feel for the, the Harvard Shine uh, individuals here. But my meeting schedule with them is kind of on an as-needed basis with a once-a-month schedule, what we call a sync meeting, where we just go through everybody's upcoming inspections, their do-outs, what uh, tasks they're working on that might be more administrative in nature, uh, things along those lines. And it's just kind of going point by point, looking at all their duty-related items, and then also any personnel or personal-related items that I can uh, potentially assist them with. So. Pretty straightforward, but I think there's uh, ways that I can get a little bit more information out of them to be able to take a little bit more action on their path. Um, so, uh, Ulysses Linares, I'm the commander of the 3rd um, Air Support Operations Squadron. So, um, like most Air Force units, we have a we have an operations slash scheduling meeting, which syncs all of our operations. But what I'll focus on is our staff meeting. Um, and we're in a transition right now because, like uh, Lena was saying, a lot of it is just regurgitation of standard admin. Um, and I've realized that that wastes people's time. Um, and it really just has people build a slide and then they come to brief me the slide as if I can't read the slide. Um, so the bottom line is I'm eliminating all of that 
um, and they will just have the slides done. I will review them. If I have questions, I can deal with them individually. Um, but the staff meeting will focus on our priorities, um, which we have standing priorities, which is readiness. Um, it is um, taking care of our airmen and their families, and it's developing leaders. Um, and of those, we have tailored priorities, which right now is changing our culture. Um, we had a, um, a, a relief of command for people. Um, the top four were relieved, um, and there was a hazing incident. So um, we're changing our culture. Um, operational processes and then our facilities um, and so the staff meeting will be used for the leaders to actually talk about those priorities um, and really we have developed lines of effort on how we're going to attack those and make it more collaborative where it's an open form to how, how are we doing on these priorities and all the admin stuff is stuff that we can just I can do that on my own on a Sunday um, and if I have questions I just ask them I'm Gretchen Van Meering. I'm with Eloisa with Shine, and I'll just add that uh, I came on to Shine just this past summer, end of summer, and asked specifically to help start it look from the outside, although new, in terms of processes and strategies and that sort of thing for the organization. So Eloisa and I are sort of charged at this point for looking at that. How can we improve the efficiency of our team? How can we make everybody want to be contributors rather than asking them to be contributors? And that sort of thing. So this is really, really important to us. Right now. Okay. So Mark Ballard with Smith Technologies. Um, really like the organizational silence um, comment that was made. Um, so like Dennis, I'm in a weekly exec meeting. Um, then I have seven direct reports with about 90 total uh, reports. Um, I meet two times a, a month with the uh, four regional managers that are outside of the building. Um, and then the, the rest of the direct reports, the other three, since they're in the building there at Kelsland Corporate, um, they can grab me at any time. I don't really have set meetings with them. Um, the set meetings more with the regional managers um, updating from processes from executive staff development um, programming uh, okay. services. Okay. Any New York team? Hi, I'm John Poole. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Uh, John Poole, I work at Military Sealift Command, um, and we have three alignment meetings per week that are each an hour and a half uh, with the 30 top leaders in the command, um, and they're all chaired by the Admiral, and they served a purpose when they were started uh, three years ago to, for alignment. Uh, information sharing and decision making uh, but for the last couple months I can't remember the last meeting where a decision was actually made in, in the meetings um, so it's really just bringing people together uh, for an hour and a half three times a week uh, to share information that most people are already aware of um, so that's that's the challenge we're facing at military Seal command hi my name is Natalie Gray I work for Air Force Reserve Command right now I'm the religious affairs functional manager so basically run the career field for the religious affairs side um, we have a weekly leadership meeting that I'm coming to realize that it's the boss's attempt to mentor and coach and I think we need to rename that meeting so that the younger folks participating in it actually understand the coaching <laughs> Um, and then we have a staff meeting, which much like the commander there had talked about, it was admin. We're reviewing our manager's internal control program. I may make the suggestion that the boss and I review those pieces on a weekly basis versus um, using our staff time to review the data that they've already updated. Um, we also have part of that meeting is we're making decisions based upon um, our recruiting prospects and reviewing packages internal to our program there. My own side on the senior enlisted side, I have outstations that we just hired over the past year. So on a monthly basis, I'm doing meetings with them to get a local level perspective, um, do some training initiatives with them. And this, then also identifying any key specific issues that I can then run roads or, or blocks for them so that I can make sure that they have the time they need. Uh, good morning. My name's uh, Craig Wood. I'm a one star in the Royal Navy. Uh, and I suppose I'm looking at this through three different perspectives. One is um, my current remit is, is I, I generate about two thirds of the Royal Navy surface ships to go on operations. Um, so I use a small command team meeting once a week. I've tried to reverse the order so I speak last. 
uh, and to try and, you know, the military naturally goes towards a more elephant model, I think, than cheetah. Uh, but what I want to do, I feel, is that's about eight of us, that's the captains and myself, I want to bring in the next level down as well, the squadron commanders, uh, and empower them. So that's the first bit, I suppose. The second bit is uh, on a, then the next day, on a Tuesday, I will, through video teleconference, be one of about a dozen or 14 participants in a meeting where the fleet commander is chairing it. So how do I make that meeting better as a participant? Uh, and then the final point, I suppose, that I'd like some assistance with potentially is as of the 1st of April, I will subsume the other flotilla, a surface flotilla within the Royal Navy. So I'll then be responsible for everything that's gray and floats and flies a white ensign in terms of getting it ready for operations. And that will therefore mean bringing in another organization that's geographically disparate. How do I run that meeting of, uh, or the battle rhythm of that meeting using video teleconference? Yeah. And my spies tell me that that organization, if I'm an elephant, he's a whole herd of them. Uh, <laughs> so I'm really keen, I'm really keen to break that, that, uh, that, that dynamic. Thanks. Hi, my name is Harry Janelius. We're at the Navy Reserve Component Command at Great Lakes. Can, can you just speak up a, a little bit louder? Sure. My name is Harry Janelius with the Navy uh, Reserve Component Command at Great Lakes, Illinois. Uh, we do a daily um, small group uh, meeting with uh, the four key uh, command suite players, the captain, the master chief, myself, and the chief staff officer. Uh, that's daily, 9 o'clock meeting on Mondays. That rolls into an all-hands meeting with our entire staff where we do training and just general announcements. Uh, Tuesday, we have a department head meeting for uh, key department heads and our khaki leadership. Um, that's kind of where everybody just reports to the captain. Um, that's gone from like a two hour meeting. We're down to about an hour, sometimes under an hour. Um, but since he took over, just I think he needed to get up to speed and the meetings went very long and now they're getting yes. a little more manageable. Um, on a monthly basis, we have a um, scorecard meeting and a mobilization meeting with our 24 supported commands. Uh, to make sure they're tracking in their metrics. Uh, and then there's just a lot of other small meetings, but uh, those are the key ones. And okay. For most of the people at this table. Okay. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Tice. I'm at the uh, Coast Guard's Leadership Development Center, and I could say ditto for a lot of uh, some of the meetings here. Basically, the high level, unit wide meeting, uh, two times a month, command all the way down to lowest members. So that's about an hour and a half. Um, and then weekly department head meeting, so that's eight to ten people, usually in the department that I work in. And then honestly, uh, pretty much every day of the week, I've got special teams, projects, uh, planning for next events, uh, doing an hour or two hours, usually half the day spent in some type of meeting, planning the next event, uh, or coordinating. So that's pretty much the generic answer for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Samantha. I am the human resources director for a smaller company uh, located in New Jersey. We are a digital marketing agency um, serving small business. So um, we have daily huddles. Uh, we have our entire team, we're on a very smaller scale, um, but our entire team, we have about 30 people within the organization um, and we divide those into smaller groups on a daily basis. Uh, these are very structured meetings where we talk about what is on the agenda for the day. Um, what are the metrics from the day before um, and any kind of bottlenecks or challenges that uh, each, team, each team member might be facing for the day um, and how someone you know, of the leadership team or someone around them can help. Um, weekly, we have executive meetings uh, where, and even in the daily huddles, we find that it's more of just a format. Um, we don't know if we're clearly identifying um, or if we're finding the measurable or the quantitative data that we need to in regard to metrics. Um, I think the challenge is uh, we're facing organizational silence right now, uh, which is a big challenge for us. A lot of people are very unmotivated um, and kind of just going through the routine. Um, in our weekly executive meetings, we have a ton of meetings. I think as everyone kind of said, we have a lot of impromptu meetings and just mindless meetings um, where we're not getting a lot accomplished. And it really, uh, it really inhibits us from uh, progressing. I think we're, we're at a, a standstill with that. Um, so our weekly executive meetings are really uh, where, you know, we, we talk about as uh, the executives of the organization, you know, kind of what progress we've made on the, um, the tasks that we've instilled for ourselves um, and how we can help one another, very similar structure to our daily huddles. Um, but, you know, I think the biggest challenge that we're facing right now as a young company, we have a number of changes that happen, um, you know, that we've consulted with 
uh, CMOs and, you know, different business coaches. Um, and we, we find new processes to take place, but our organization is just there. It's silent. Um, nobody's excited. Nobody's, uh, really happy about some of these larger changes that we spent actually 18 hours in a, in a room, you know, trying to filter out. And we actually adapted some of the, uh, wonderful things we learned at next jump, what's working, what's not. We, we kicked off our 2020 with that, um, with that, uh, you know, format uh, with our executive team and a consultant, and it was actually pretty powerful. Um, and so you know, we've made some changes from there, but we're just facing organizational silence. We rolled some things out recently. Everyone's just looking at us um, and just doing. So that's one of our biggest challenges right now. Okay, so is that everyone in New York? Um, so that, awesome. So, so thanks for sharing the, uh, yeah, I think it, uh, it points to some of the challenges sometimes of teaching is, is you know, different organizations are different stages with different challenges. I think as you kind of touched on, I think some of the themes of uh, uh, organizational silence, we don't use it as much uh, in terms of a term, but it's, it's the, the, the fear of speaking up. And, and the challenge of this things get more complex for all of us and, and our organizations and teams are, are moving faster. There's a cost to that. Um, and so, uh, but, but I think the second one as well is, is, um, you know, this notion of, of, uh, you know, if some of the dynamics as a leader are changing and I think leaders, we all feel the pressure to, you know, have, uh, effective teams that are engaging with each other, making good decisions. We feel the responsibility, the outcome and the performance of the group. Um, you know, what role do those, those meetings have? So I'll share in more detail as I go forward, but just I'll share since you guys all share for yours, what it looks like today from, from Next Jump's standpoint, and I'll use Tom and I. So we run uh, the business to cyber business, so kind of half our business. So we have an all hands meeting. We have that every Monday. Um, we have a deliberateness to that meeting because we want to informate and share kind of the results of the week, what's happening um, really early in the week. Um, so I'll, I'll, we're going to go into more detail on our staff meeting. Um, and that's a big investment. That's everyone in our company. So that's, um, but again, that, would, that, would, that is our, our largest meeting. Um, Tom and I then run our version of kind of a team meeting, a department meeting. Um, we alternate this once every two weeks. Um, so we have about 25 or so people that is kind of in our core team. Um, we alternate that in the alternate week with our senior leaders of that team, and we have a small group. All right, so uh, what Tom mentioned before, where do we have less meetings? Where we actually have less meetings, as we've gotten stronger at feedback loops, building coders, decision making and building and kind of coaching and that model has gotten it was a transition took a while but as that happens as a leader first and foremost when you th i think when you think about people and making decisions do you trust them do they trust them are they getting good experience uh, or do they have the judgment i should say not so much experience and if they are wrong like are they going to be wrong in a, in a vacuum if not i kind of want to know so as you build an organization in a team environment where there are more feedback loops, there's more coaching, decision-making, for us, one of the benefits that we found, and Tom touched on this, is a lot of the meetings, if you want to speak to it, are in much smaller groups as down to two, right? So a lot of our work at the senior levels are in pairs. We are making decisions. We're thinking out in a big part, what are the key elephants in the room? What are the key kind of questions that our team is crippling us for that? And so... I share that a little bit and some of the dynamic of where we're at now in our larger meetings, you know, the, the setup is different. That's it's, it's in parallel with some of the work that we talk about in coaching and feedback loops, et cetera, elsewhere has actually helped us evolve our meetings. So we were going to be ending with some recommendations for where to start because we didn't even start that way. And again, some of the challenge in this is each of you have your own situation with us, but I hope that you can take some principles away from this and some ideas in your own. And we'll have a Q&A and feel free to bring up literal questions about your specific ones and we'll, we'll give some thoughts as it. All right. So uh, with that, I will do the PowerPoint part. In, in New York, can you see the, the PowerPoint? Okay. So a main topic that we're going to talk about, I have one theme on this, maybe two themes about takeaways. Um, 
I do think it's an under-optimized part within, a, uh, within organizations of thinking about your meetings as a deliberate, you know, a deliberate sense. So just like you can with people, just like you can with products, this is a huge investment. So if there's one part, I encourage you to be deliberate with it. It means experimenting, thinking about it, thinking about crucial things. What's the real point of it? Um, then, you know, I ran, you know, with Charlie, I was one of the, I'm one of the co-founders here. I was, I've been responsible for basically 24 years of my career as a staff member. So, you know, and, and there's a part where it just, we kind of took from different advisors and other things, how others kind of almost like folklore of how you run staff meetings. I used to work at Standard & Poor's, we took some of that. Um, so that's part one. Part two really is this notion of how do you turn it on? So many of you spoke about it, that how do you get more people to dial? How do you get more people in the community caring about what's being discussed, what's going on to help sense make, to bring up information that allows a team to make better decisions and move forward? So, it's a, two kind of key elements that I hope you take away from this. So I shared this a little bit yesterday. Uh, I think most of you were on it, but I, I, you know, I think I like this quote of, if you had identified one word, the reason the human race is not achieved, it's full potential that word would be meetings. And I think it's just frustrating. So I think it's normal. I, part of the reason I wanted everyone to kind of share is we all go through you know, the challenges. How do you run effective meetings? I think as a leader, so I'm mo almost everybody here was leaders. I know some of you, you're also participants. I'm going to comment a little bit more from a leadership standpoint. I think we know what it feels like to be in meetings where it goes on and on and where the person looking at her phone or disengaged. The hard part, though, as a leader is as follows, is we feel the pressure of the outcome. We feel the pressure to get the group going. And we also set up, oftentimes unintentionally, that in these meetings, we're on the hook to make the decisions. The team is, is by, you know, they're afraid to make a decision, so they backwards fill it in and it's set up so that, boom, here's kind of what I'm thinking. What do you think, boss? Should we do it? And now all of a sudden, on the spot, you got to make the decision. On the time, in terms of feedback, I've felt this, and it's not just in meetings, but oftentimes we looked around and be like, why am I the only truth teller in this team? Right? If like it's not going well, it's a terrible idea, terrible presentation, whatever it is, I look around and no one's saying a word. So now as a boss, I feel, or a leader, I feel like, well, I gotta say something because this is gonna impact us as a group. And the ramifications, you have to, you have to, you have no choice, but the ramifications to that. So part of the dial is how do you engage the people on this group in more often and use uh, the, this, the, the time that you're spending the investment. So some of you talked about more efficient meetings, I'm gonna emphasize the word effective. I do believe over time, the efficiencies it will come, right? But if you go after efficiency up front, I warn you that, that I felt this as well, is that ultimately people complain, they won't be effective, and you'll fall back to ways um, that you did it before. Um, so I've touched this, um, you know, this is another way of looking at it. Um, we call and just, we, we talked about this yesterday, Charlie talked about it, but, but uh, just to kind of reemphasize, we use King in pastor meetings. I think sometimes a good language is helpful. So when you go and interact with others, I find that this is just helpful framing of what happens. Um, the King pastor is, is uh, you know, really the person in charge where people go around and report up to the boss. Um, and they oftentimes the downside of this is people will spend their time trying to convince their ideas the best. And oftentimes, depending on the level of the boss, we do this for the board meeting. We have the board meeting. We used to have meetings upon meetings to prep for the board meeting. So that, the, and, and so, so that, again, that was once a quarter, so that there wasn't that much cost. But still, there was a giant level of emphasis. So we've gotten to the point, I'm not saying you start there, we've gotten to the point where there's almost very little, we use the board meeting almost as a checkpoint um, you know, for the co-owners in our organization. We didn't start there. In a pastor meeting, you know, this is one we can flip flop is that you're really trying to you feel, so I'll use it in my own terms. You feel that it's not going well. It often happens when it's not going that well, right? It's kind of like, or maybe it's a new initiative and you're trying to get people be, you know, behind the new initiative. Um, and so you feel as, as though you've got to really kind of convince and advocate and sell kind of what's going on to inspire the troops, motivate them. There's a place for that. But one of the things I found is that oftentimes is the pastor meeting, a consequence of that, it can be to lead to avoidance of problems and it reinforces that the boss is oftentimes a sole source of that inspiration. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think bottom line, like it, very, very, this is like very typical, like you'll have a kind of micromanager type boss 
you have this big meeting, everything's followed up, they make all the decisions, and then every once in a while, everyone's so irritated that they have to do a song and dance to try to motivate them. And you'll end up with these kind of dysfunctional groups where, you know, they're kind of flip-flopping between, you know, mandating everything and... and, and I'd, be, I'd, be, and, yeah, I'd be cautious to say dysfunctional only in the sense of there, there, is, a, there is a benefit to, to the way meetings are brought and there's a reason. And so I'll share this in a, in a little bit. It's, okay. Great. Yep. Can you go back to that last slide? What was the bottom one there? The audience, and then what the so, so one of the challenges of pastor is that it, it can often the team can default to it's the boss's job to inspire right just like it's a boss's job to give feedback it's a boss's job to make the decision so in this dial there's a whole slew to run effective teams you do need to educate informate what's going on you need more people to make decisions you need more people to give feedback you also need more people to inspire right so how can you set that up more deliberately Touched on before of, of, of again, I think this is, uh, if it helps in terms of the emphasis to others, why are we spending time on the staff meeting, et cetera? Um, it's, uh, you know, if you want successful, deliberate, high-performing teams, this is the one ritual, which I'll get into here. It's an investment in your team where if you took a step back, are you ritualistically investing in a king or your team, you know, for the leader making all the decisions, motivating, or is it, is it investment for the team to become better decision makers? What we're going to talk about, it is an investment. The investment's already happening. There will be an investment. They say, you know, anything, you know, if you want something great, you always got to go to bad first. So we'll get into some of this on the implementation stuff. But I just encourage you to think that there is as an element as an investment as you as an, as an enterprise, as a team. It's significant already. So in that changing, you know, we can talk and so people get sent to courses, how you should, you know, be better, you know, whatever it is in the leadership side. But the reality in this kind of notion of habits, what are your consistent rituals to reinforce what you want in a team, unintentional consequences of meetings being run without being deliberate, is that you're actually reinforcing in many ways a, a lot of those behaviors that are currently in the team. I like how uh, General Leonard in the Air Force described it. His mission, he wants, he wants his... Uh, Airmen, the people who work for him, to have make daily decisions aligned to the mission. That's what, at the end of the day, daily decisions aligned to the mission. And if people can do that at the lowest possible level, like that's success. So I don't want to derail, so you might get to it. But yeah. so that that sounds great for the general, right? And it works very well for a CEO. But a lot, most of us, are, well, I wouldn't say most, but in the military, most of us are finding ourselves in middle management. Yeah. Um, and even though I've got a no six too. or a one star, you know. So the, the, the question becomes, how does that general know the decisions that are being made? So that general can be the two-star general, who can be the three, who can be the four, who's yeah, yeah. the answer up the chain. Yeah. And I think it is a dial, meaning like there are, if some meetings should be tactical and like we're making decisions and we're getting stuff done. But it's that if you don't start deliberately saying, okay, we need to invest in a, in a model that is not so hierarchical in terms of decisions being made, you're never going to get anything else. Okay. And, and, and I think if I had to maybe put a little word on your question, it sounds like some of your meetings that you're referencing in kind of the middle level are, are, are smaller meetings. So there may be four to six, eight people. Is that what you're referencing? No, or? I'm more referencing. So there is a, there is a purpose for a commander's update brief. Sure. Um, so the commander can then understand the decisions that he's empowered us to make. Sure. Uh, understood. How that's, how that's affected the group um, and the decision that one department head makes affects all the other department heads. So there's a reason to do it in a group. And then the boss now has that, so he can relay to his boss, totally. this is where I'm at. Totally. Does that make sense? It, it does. Uh, so it does. I'm looking it for does. the feedback loop. If I'm going to push the decisions down, and I don't have a commander's update brief, which is a very elephant model of reading yeah. boss, where do we get that feedback? Um, totally. So I, I hope as we go through this, yeah. it, it comes out a little bit more. Um, but to Tom's point, yes, that, that is a, that is a, it's, it's a dial. I was just going to say, I, I know in, in the military, and I just want to know from your guys' standpoint, when we say decision meeting, so our staff meeting hardly ever, we have a lot of, I guess, decision diverse commanders who, if yeah. you bring a problem for him to decide at that meeting, A, he's not going to like that, and B, he would hardly, or he or she will never make that decision. Mm -hmm. What you're really going to get is he's going to task you with five other things to get him more in, because we look at information I need. Every single thing is I want my decision to be 100% right. Um, so do you guys all feel that too in your guy in the, in the civilian sector too, that 
they are decision averse because they don't want to make the call right there without all the information. Totally, totally. Well, and, and I think it's one, one, someone else had referenced, you know, one of the challenges is it feels like no one's, you know, it means used to be decision making and now they're not. Yeah. And so, I, I, you know, I think a couple things. I, I think that there is an element of uh, maybe first and foremost to recognize especially as you go into decision-making, all of us feel uncomfortable making decisions because there's a risk inherent to that, right? There's a downside to it and there's a potential upside and we're constantly weighing that. So as it relates to meetings, so I think part of the challenge as a leader is like how do you create some of those loops so people feel one more safe to make decisions so that requires ability to fail and lessons and loops on that. Um, and it also requires a little bit of patience to you know, understand in many ways and segment what types of decisions you know, we are going to you know, allow, we, call, we use the, the actual sh a ship analogy, we use above the waterline versus below the waterline. Above the waterline, you can kind of skin your knee and make some mistakes, the ship won't look as pretty, but it's not going down. Below the waterline, it's, this, is a, you know, this is gonna sink the ship. And so there's a part for us, we debate all the time, what are the ones that like, we can't, you know, can't let go to. and can't afford to? But oftentimes we, you know, I think as leaders, we, we don't do that segmentation, we don't differentiate, and we can treat everything as mission critical. So th then the other part in the meeting side is, let's bring that back as we go through this, because I think there's another part of your question, which is, you know, should meetings have decisions or not? And different types of meetings, I mean, uh, go ahead. I, I was just gonna add something to this point. I think what certainly I attempt to do is if I know I have a meeting, I have a decision that needs to be made or staff see a decision that needs to get made, I attempt to make a tentative decision, talk to my colleagues before the meeting, so that by the time we get to the meeting, I've kind of already prepped it already as it relates to where I'm gonna go, or if there are other key elements that I want somebody to take hold at, I'm bringing up what's the area that somebody might, I might want to take heat for, and I want them to, to attack it in the meeting so that everybody has the ability to, to kind of pile on, for lack of a better way of putting it, and then go out, solve it, come back with the solutions like it before, rather than having a long discussion around a typical problem. Well, well, one, I, I think, part that can be, uh, maybe a couple ways to answer this, is first and foremost, I think meetings can be used as sense making. So how can you get the most sense into there? And th there are a few different parts of that. So one of the ways to do sense making, especially for this, so, so I don't know if anyone, everyone in Boston or in New York heard, but uh, Dennis was kind of saying that one of the things when you have a decision as a leader, right, you want to kind of, you know, get feedback ahead of time, kind of flesh it out, and then go and kind of give the decision in the meeting ahead of it versus kind of be on the spot and have to make the decision in the meeting. So, which makes sense. I, I think one of the parts of, as we go through this, there are some other tools you can use. So for instance, one of the things I'll do in a meeting for this is we'll use part of the meeting for sense making about what are the issues, what am I missing, which may or may not have affected what you're getting out of. So, so there's a part of what are my blind spots as a team, as a leader. But then there are part two, when I have a decision to, that like, I wanna put in front of the team, right? What I would often do is go and say, go into pastor mode. Here's my decision, here's what we're gonna do, and I do the same thing, I get feedback from like Tom or other people ahead of time. Decision been made, here we're gonna go. Now I start to get into tactical, here's what I want people to do, and people have questions, I'm a little skeptical on that, I'd have my answer. So one of the things we've learned to do is kind of pause, and, and it was just, we probably should have this as a slide, but is, uh, Charlie references, is a point of view, kind of an intention, then feedback loop, then decision. So what I mean by that is you can also use a meeting, and so we'll get into this, I often use the middle of my meeting to not only put out like the pillars of priorities and the results, how they're doing, it doesn't have to be me, but oftentimes I will put out a point of view of an intention of a decision I wanna make, I go through the, the reasons why, and I get feedback loops in the meeting, it could be verbally, it could be through the app, of what am I missing in that decision. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna change my mind, but it allows two things to happen. There might be data points that are information I did not know that will adjust my decision. But what it does is powerful on the other side as well, is there is a power in the group, in that group there, 
feeling as though they have a voice before we're going into action. That little bit of pause has worked wonders for, for me in a meeting, that slight pause to get into that action. So that's just another. As I hear you speaking, um, when we talk about maintenance as a compliance organization, yeah. and one of the things that I, you mentioned feedback, our daily production meetings are feedback and training so that we get the entire force to make the decisions that we can. Uh, 1,200 people, those production meetings have 20 to 25 people in them, but those are the senior NCOs in charge of their specific organizations and um, kind of at the flight level, and they come up and with a synchronization of putting everything together. So when you talk about feedback, that is immediate and in the morning and at night of the decisions that you're making. And so when you talk about fear and trust, when I know from my senior level, we are to give up that daily feedback loop, then I don't know that we are at our level, right? Like at my, my old lady level, um, concerned about going to an app with that or doing something else with that. And so my, my hesitation when I hear this is how do I still get that same feedback and make the meeting effective? Sure. And so I use the app some of it, but what I really mean is a feedback loop. And so again, some of the challenges in this is some meetings that you guys are running already have feedback loops and already have voices speaking up. Others will be less. So when we get into some of the principles of it and show some examples, I think it's the, what you want is ultimately is to make kind of good decisions and as, as a unit and as a, and you know, and because things are getting more complex and moving faster, that's the, and, and there's more information you know, how to train people in sense making that decision is, is, is our challenge as a leader. Um, and so I shared this a little bit yesterday. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything new. Uh, I, I touched on most of this. We talk about in kind of three uh, um, uh, uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll come back. I won't rush. Um, so I think this roughly touches in terms of uh, inspire, inspect, get things done, make sure people are on the, on the same page. Um, one of the things we'll end with is uh, once going through the foundational kind of investment, means can also be used to develop your people. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that stage today because frankly, uh, you may not even believe me at this point. Um, and, and situationally, there's some foundational elements first. So we shared this a little bit yesterday. I think this uh, goes to it. We think about kind of three steps, engaging, inspiring, and develop. Um, so you'll notice in here, I don't have a lot on decision making. And again, I am talking on larger, uh, larger meetings, so these are not smaller meetings. Um, but when I say this, it's, that's not to say you can't put decisions in front of people. And I would argue in, in this engagement part, the community voice turned on versus off, you know, these interactions are happening all the time and decisions, someone's looking for the boss to make the decision. Um, but how in many ways can you dial from people feeling like spectators, participants, um, it changes from the, the leadership standpoint. So I, I think we'll, these are really the three kind of principles. When we look at an effective meeting, this is what we found, that when they have, if you have these three elements kind of baked into it, that there's an element of engagement. So people aren't just sitting there, but they're, act, they're, they're speaking out, they're having some, there's some element of engagement in the meeting, that there's some element of inspiration, meaning they can see progress of the team, where we're going, uh, and there's some element of development. So people are getting, you know, they're getting better. Either the team is getting better decision-making out of it, better awareness, uh, or even from an individual level, you know, we're very deliberate to put people, you know, have people present, you know, it's basically it's presenting and giving an opportunity to, to, to stand up. And so it's, we found that by you know engineering the meeting and tweaking it in certain ways, you can you can add these elements into it. The I put down at the bottom the the traditional meaning is good at clarity and short term action. So th there are times when you need that, there are times you get that. So part of the discernment I think is an organization. I would argue though that it's dialed down to the investment in making people to think. There's an element of as things get more complex, as teams are more networked. You know, there's an there's an element around investment in making people to think. Some of that short-term action um, can be, you know, is it combined to long-term action? It doesn't necessarily have to happen in the meeting itself. So it's it's a slight change of lens of uh, of where the, that can get accomplished. So I'm going to now go to the origins of our staff meeting. Um, so. Uh, 
I'm going to start a little bit of where we are today and then go back to where we, to where we started because that's helpful. So this just gives you a, a flavor in here. You can see our agenda. This is from our, our Monday staff meeting. Um, so we start with what we call weekly buzz or highlights. Um, so we'll give you a flavor of what that is. But those are really uh, kind of highlights and education of noteworthy things for the staff that are happening in, in the group. Um, and I think we have a slide, right, that shows our We'll show you the, the noteworthy things in our company. Um, we then have uh, two key updates, the Biz 1 and Biz 2 updates. So those are the results. The, meet, the meeting is the results. Um, uh, and very key, and so we just added to our leadership team, so, so there was a, an element in there. So in the results, uh, kind of those updates, it's very kind of regimented. We show metrics, we show the results, we show kind of our, some of you mentioned kind of the key priorities the, the uh, update on those key priorities. So, and those are senior leaders. They're not always CEOs, so, you know, Tom and I are, uh, we'll do this, sometimes we'll have kind of our version of department heads. That's a pretty regimented part. So we provide clarity coming out of this of, you know, our, what are our metrics, what are, where are we to goals in our key biggest parts, right? Um, and then we end with a showcase. Well, I shouldn't say we end. The last deliberate thing we do is a showcase. The showcase we use as a, uh, a highlighted both person and project within NextShop that our leadership team feels is showing innovation, representative innovation happening in the command, in the team at NextShop. And we'll show you some of our origins, but one of the things that's been really helpful for is we have a deliberateness of who we choose does a couple things. It's a form of recognition, and it also kind of, it sets in people's mind and other leaders' mind that we want innovation, we want to highlight it, and we need your help in meetings to go look out for things that are innovative. It's not to ignore the results, but oftentimes one of the things that we've struggled with is teams so often go after results, it's all we care about, what are the results, what are the things, that we can start to get very short-term focused on that, and there's very little innovation. So... Uh, and was, then, there, was there a question in, in New York? Thanks very much. Uh, so, so this is really bringing it to life to me. And I, and I suddenly thought, are we using the term meeting to cover too many things, that single word? A bit like referring to Africa. You know, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a single country, uh, totally. but we treat it like that sometimes. Because, of course, what you, I think it's Greg, sorry, uh, have described there to me is a staff briefing. That was very much about bringing the team up, this information flow top down, some of the meetings that we've referred to previously have been about situational awareness for the boss, so bringing information to the boss to either then decide or just as an update. And then, of course, we do have board-level meetings, which tend to take a lot of bandwidth because there's a, a strict agenda to be followed, some of which will be updates, some of which will be decisions, uh, and some you know, will, will be other things. So I wonder, I just, and literally I'm thinking as we're doing this, that, that meeting is... I'm not saying it's unhelpful, but, but it's, it, it covers such a broad array, doesn't it? Totally. And different, different organizations are different. The one maybe challenge I'd have to think of, of an assumption you're making is this is serving many purposes. This is also an update to the boss. In the sense of the Biz 1 update, the Biz 2 update, even the, the weekly buzz and the showcase, the boss is hearing that at the same time as the staff. So I, 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 I just... I say that in the sense of it's allowed us to streamline many things. The, the other thing we do is the feedback app. The feedback app now at the end, we use it for five minutes. In this case here, there are too many people in our company to have like a, on a, a conversation. When we do our team meeting, we'll have a Q&A part. I cover that with some of the smaller meetings. So we have more face-to-face. -face. In a staff meeting, it just it would take too long. So in this case, so we got, this is just from last staff meeting. We got 178 pieces of 178 data points from people on, on the key speakers in this. So now you get to the point on the boss update. Does Charlie and Megan have a, for instance, have a point of view on what they just saw? Absolutely. Absolutely. But here's the part before they have to give feedback or change everything. They now have decisions, can I let this go? They read the feedback in the app. Sometimes they don't even in their meetings, they may be traveling, they can read the feedback in the app and get some amazing sense making of what happened in it. Where people, you know, did someone present something, results down and people get feedback for. So it allows them not to have to make decisions, <laughs> give feedback on the spot, 
they can now pick and choose was the community's voice and feedback to them sufficient? Or do they have a point of view that the crowd's feedback might be wrong, right? Or may not having a long-term view. So there's an element on this that, that, again, this is where we are now. It's not where we started, but it is a both and update on both. Yeah. Uh, maybe to, to break it down, there's basically three sections. There's like one and five in the middle. So one is buzz, five is showcase. In the middle is kind of the, like Craig said, the, the meat of the business. And the idea with that middle is that we are teams themselves updating. It's pretty much everyone seeing it for the first time. It's incredibly powerful to get the community input on, you know, is this, a, you know, in typically their plans. Like this is the business results of what we're doing in response to that. And it's incredibly powerful to get the overall team's reaction to that. And then Charlie Megan, they're, they're looking at that. And sometimes they'll interject and be like, act, sometimes someone do a terrible update, right? Like a really bad plan. And the whole group is like, that's a bad idea. Don't do that. They don't even have to say anything. This whole group is like, that's a terrible idea. But it's not like if we see something happening, and actually we disagree with the group. It's not like, it's not a democracy that, you know, people don't want to do something or think it's a bad idea. You need to let it go. Uh, but it, it's very powerful because you can, un those are the most awesome instances because you're realizing that, okay, as a leader, I believe we should go down path A, but the group is saying we should not do that. So there's a disconnect that we can just be forthright and have a whole discussion about what's, you know, why do we, why do we as more experienced people see this as the wrong path? Uh, it's just very good at getting it on a line. So, so getting into the weeds, and we'll share this as uh, the, the collateral as, as, as interested. Uh, but this is our, our highlights, our buzz, uh, literally from our staff meeting on Monday. So just to give you a flavor of what we actually showed. One of the things that was really cool they sh they, this time was they actually shared internally buzz on buzz, which was what good like looks like from the community to send to the buzz team or the highlights team and what bad looks like. So it's things like clear talking points, context, why should the community care, key notables um, versus lots of text, no talking points, the relevance to neck jumpers. So again, we're 10 years into it. I'll show you our origins, but uh, um, so we use it for development. So Rosie, uh, we train kind of our junior side. So she's a junior person about a year into her career at Next Jump in the, in the London office. So she's also training this. Again, this is a today thing, not a first part, but she uses it for public speaking. So one of the things we prep is awesome questions. So some is what cripples my effectiveness as a public speaker? Why do I want to be a good public speaker? So when people give her feedback at the end, they're giving her feedback on and, her And community. literally that's how she started. She got up and said, hey, I'm Rosie, I'm in the UK office, I'm giving buzz today. Let me tell you why I'm doing this. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bad public speaker when, whatever that said, and I want to do it because. And so we're, it's being very, the cool part of that is it gets, it'll, so, and she will get, she got a lot of feedback after that event on her public speaking, you know, how, how to make it better. But if, when you, at the front, self-assess yourself, it makes it so much easier for everyone else to give you kind of honest, honest feedback. So we found that's like a really important nuance to it. Um, so just to give you a, so some of the actual detail may, may be less relevant, but this just gives you a flavor. I'll go through a few, but some key points of, a, of this slide. And again, we'll talk about how to start. Um, you may not, your team will push you back greatly on having to do work like this. So uh, when you start. So but this is where we are today. A few things in here. Big, you know, it's not a lot of text. It's easy to read. There's a part where the person speaking buzz gets all the slides by 9 a.m. Monday morning, so it's three hours at best to prepare. So, you know, things of like what the product is or what the update is, the key talking points, and then you'll notice in here it says, please give feedback to Annie. We put the corner of whatever that update is, right? So if you have questions on, you know, in this case, this was an app update. So one of the things that we struggled with in our, all our HR technology is one of the current versions of it. And people ask all the time. So this is an example where it's just boom, one slide, boom, this tool is available. It's now in use. You can see where all the version controls are. Any questions, ask any, right? So I'm gonna go through kind of quickly. This is kind of campus recruiting. Again, what schools and fair dates are. A lot of people need this information, um, you know, because they're part of it. Uh, this happened last week, it was very cool. We had two of our very young engineers in Boston get invited to speak at MIT and, and actually teach a course. Um, so this is Rosie still briefing these. Rosie's briefing the whole thing, yeah. right? So we don't take turns when Keith doesn't go in because Keith would want to talk for about five minutes on all the cool stuff he does. And it's not long, um, it's just, I mean, punch, boom, 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 punch. punch. But it's cool now, like there's a pulse that like, other engineers are like, wow, I didn't know, without doing much, other engineers are like, huh, they're teaching at MIT. 
like Damon Go and follow up with Keith. Um, flagship bus. So this is our New York. What's going on there? You see London Cornelius. So again, it's not also, we were at a, you know, Fort Worth in Texas at one, and they have someone that talks about the party that's coming up, their holiday party. But like the guy that did it was like, we have a holiday party on December 6th. And, and so it's just, I don't know, you can also put kind of funner things that like, you know, the boss doesn't have to like spend time convincing people to do some of that stuff. Um, our fitness competition, we just show the results. Life events, we do kind of the anniversary. Um, birthdays. birthdays would, would be there. Um, Quick question in New York. Yep. Yeah. Like the 10X, do you have a, a strict time limit for each presenter in these staff meetings? Is there a time limit at all? Um, it's a great question. So no, but uh, we, we have a pretty hour long, I mean, we keep it to an hour. Um, it's pretty convinced when someone new comes in to do buzz, one, they've been in the company, so they've seen it. Um, again, I tell people to use their best judgment, but I basically tell people, give me a heads up if they believe it's going to go on longer than seven minutes. So it, to me, it's more of like less a rule, but more the same thing with the, the business updates. There's a certain time I have, it's kind of like, you know, I just want to know if it goes up because now if there's repeated things going up, I have a decision. Do we tell people to cut it down? or do we allow the staffing to go longer? Um, and so if we do have, have a staffing go longer, because I get feedback in the app, they're okay if I tell people up front, this is gonna be an hour and 15 minute. But similar to we've run two hour meetings, people get really pissed if they have it an hour and now it's running two hours. Mm -hmm. So again, I try not to make rules, but I, I try to, in many ways, give people kind of common sense and then tell me I need to be informated, because if not, um, I don't know if that answers. Quick question, Tom. Mm -hmm. So with the buzz, this is a time for one person who's collected all of the information mm -hmm. to give a quick, this is, these are the things yeah. that are going on. So this is not a time for discussion. This is just, this is how we're going to update you on all there's, the stuff that's going on. There's no discussion. Okay. No discussion. So, so there's that, no discussion. So that being the case, why yeah. is that yeah. in the staffing at all versus it could be in an app or it could be on a play website? where it's not like you just go there, see the same items. Yeah. So the reason we do this is, is, you know, I think one of the parts that I think is important as a team is that there's a vibrancy, that there are things that are happening. And oftentimes we get so much information and so many updates that we become numb to it. So part of this is we, want to, we do want to show because there are neat things, like that MIT thing is really good. Seeing a picture, for instance, of Keith and the teaching with the students to me is, is versus like one of 50 updates that may or may not be noteworthy. Yeah. So there is a discernment and we have, and, and the person giving kind of highlights, if they're picking stuff that's really boring, it's kind of tactical, they will get feedback loop from the community, yeah. stop wasting our time. Yeah. So th that's that balance of, you know, there are noteworthy things going on in every team. I would argue sometimes they get crowded out because there are 50 different updates or hundred different updates going on all the time that we just become numb to. So and for us, that was worth, you know, again, five, seven minutes of, of kind of our staff's time here. You're using it as a leadership development tool. Well, right. yeah, so that's the ending point we do, but we didn't start there. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. Versus Buzz being what you as senior executives have talked about and make decisions with. No, no. Like in, in the sense of uh, now, it, 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 you know, when, when those Buzz comes and those highlights, I haven't seen any of it. In the beginning, I was the one doing the buzz, but the, the senior leaders don't see any of that. In fact, I didn't even know that they were teaching the MIT course last year, last week. So there are a lot of things. It's a way to informate everybody. This goes to the point of, as you go down this path, you start to see that, you know, the, the boss can be informated at the same time others. There's a... Yeah, I, I think there's almost there's a lesson from, you know, engineering this that, um, you know, one of the big innovations, you know, from the first iPhone, is the idea of an activity stream. What's the activity stream of the company, right? In that, uh, going back to our principles, this is an element of inspiration because you can end it up in this development aspect, but it's an element of inspiration. It's like there's activity happening at, you know, in our organization. People are doing stuff. Some of it, you know, just even life events, getting married, babies, like all the way to business accomplishments, things that are coming. There's all different ways to define that. Um, but I think it's a mistake we used to be in a pattern where basically Charlie, our CEO, would get up every week and like do an inspirational talk, like which basically spent half the week. It was so 
bad because you would put so much energy into trying to inspire everyone, but like you don't need to do that every week. And so this is kind of the micro inspiration that's still happening. And, and maybe the, the flip side, what about when something bad is happening mm -hmm. that everybody needs to know about? That's the beat. That's the, that's part we of the put beat. that in the middle. Uh, and in yeah. fact, one of the parts that we found is the community can, you know, you show innovation, you show just other things are going on. It's like an icebreaker to some extent that it actually gives confidence to actually, as a leader, to be like, sometimes it's like, oh, that we have real problems. You start to, I'm speaking for myself, I'm more of an optimist. I feel a heaviness where I start to make some decisions. Now I'm overselling what we're doing and I'm not talking about the problems. Yeah. So there's an element that like the core, I think responsibility as a leader is you gotta lead at talking about the elephants in the room. So we do that in the middle, right? And sometimes the middle is good stuff, right? The results may be great. The, We've been on a team that's like not an issue when results are great and you're flying, and those are fun discussions. It's the things when things are stuck, they're not quite moving. Um, and so, uh, so um, we probably have 20 minutes. Yeah. So, so, so uh, hold the questions because let me listen to you. No, no, because I, I, I could talk about this thing for hours. So I'm not good at the, at the time. Can you, so we can see New York. Um, so l let me just help you if it starts of now maybe getting started, if you want to take these, that I think will help. So this is how we used to run our meeting. So this is our staff meeting where, uh, this was 2005, so 15 years ago. We'd have calendar key dates, some of you may recognize, we had our versions of the department. Financial, the CFO would get up, person running corporate, vendor would get the, run our vendor team, the marketing team, the product team, which our calendar is a version of that. So you can see here, there was, maybe it's a little small on the screen, 22 pages, These are, each of the slides would be something like this. Right? So I think we've all been, I've, I've seen many of, of meetings in many other organizations that are similar. So you can see in here a little bit, you, the details don't matter as much, but the, the one behind it, that marketing summary, it's the same slide every week with some things crossed out because it was a change from week before and maybe a few things added. And typically what they do is they get up and they say, here's a marketing calendar. Here's what we did last week. Here's something new that's coming up on this. And if it was a big thing in the staff meeting, our, you know, Charlie at the time would give them feedback live on the spot. All right, so that's how we ran for years. That's how we ran it. Um, going back even further, we ran the same way, except we wouldn't show financials because in the beginning stages, we were spending all our investment money. And I thought, anybody sees our, our actual financials, we'll have no more employees. So uh, that's a whole other story. But we found bringing transparency and results and, and what's actually going on is a fundamental important part for for trust. Um, but it was, it was a king style, no feedback. Um, updates tended to be literally changes from the week. Someone had some really good language of a regurgitation of basically what they did before. So in 2010, we started to shift it um, and we started, we added in Buzz. So first was a senior leader, it was me. Um, so I did Buzz for probably a year um, where I'd started to bring kind of noteworthy stuff into the meeting. Um, and then at the end of it, we have the results going through that. And the end of it, Charlie started to get much more into the pastor style. So he, you can see here, this is, I just picked one week, but it was, we did a big deal with MasterCard and other things. So he would get up and talk about MasterCard, what this is going to mean. He talked about, we had some PR, we, we did our recognition, again, all top down recognition at the time. So this is, this was, you know, right at the stage of, of, uh, um, where some of the bigger shifts were. As we started doing development and as we started to put in other things, our staff meeting really changed. So this was the, the start in many ways of the Cheetah. And what I mean by that, we really reduced the CEO conversation. And so one of the things we challenged ourselves for a year is that Charlie at the time, now it's Charlie and Megan, would only talk once every month in the staff meeting. So that about killed him to start with. Um, I'm not recommending that you necessarily go there. We'll get into kind of some, some tips and starting. But we had a more formalized uh, program. We also added in showcase. We did the weekly results still in the middle. So this is the core parts of what are the results, what are priorities, what are our things. So all that still remained back from the initial part. Um, and, uh, but we didn't have the community voice, right? So there still was no feedback in this. It was too large to have. Sometimes in the showcase, you might have a, a question or two, but if it was a question, it honestly would be the loudest people in the room, or oftentimes it would be a senior leader. I mean, this is the entire company. This is the entire company. I'm only doing the entire company meeting, right? Um, so, but our team meetings would largely, if they were larger team meetings, would follow this because this is what we did, or they'd just be inspection meetings. 
So uh, the only other thing I'll share on this is to give you a flavor to realize I didn't do was. Um, is this uh, actually your staff slides? <laughs> Are these your actual slides that you use? The one, the, the buzz one. The, the buzz the one word. Okay. Okay. The other one I want to show you. So I just want to show you the showcase from before. So this just gives you a little bit of, um, you saw some of it when, when Chuela and I t talked about the metrics part. So they did some really neat work of how all our technology fits together. So they've been doing, you know, probably for two, uh, a, a good two to three weeks of just some really good job we'd see in the leadership level. So we nominated to Charlie and Megan that we thought this would be a good showcase. So they spent about, I don't know, it was a 10, 15 minutes part of the stuff and you see some of the slides. I don't think they went through all of them. Uh, that they went through and showcased that work. And then they got feedback at the end of that. So just closing the loop a little bit of um, what, we, what we actually do. So, uh, maybe a couple more minutes. My recommendation for, and again, these are larger meetings for how about smaller meetings, in starting this dial, and there are some nuances here, but bookend the meeting with kind of the education inspiration. Um, phase two added feedback into the agenda, right? So feedback into some of the, and building up that community voice. So again, feedback could be done via the app, depending on the size of this, may be difficult. We've had, you know, individual people that just leave, literally do feedback with paper. So they leave, you know, they just have a notepad, a little notepad of stickies in front of everybody that they leave, um, uh, you know, feedback at the last five minutes, but being able to incorporate some level of feedback that allows kind of everyone to have a voice is an extra data point into it, and that's part of the process. Um, we, we documented this in a, there's a document we'll send you after this. Oh, that'd yeah, be great. After this okay. Meeting for you. okay. So I wanted to, uh, I want to share, and I asked Jason if it was okay to include this. So, so Jason and his kind of staff at ACCLW, they just finished their second week of this, or third week of this. And so he basically shared last night, it's like not work. So uh, we had, a, it was, I, I thought, I, hopefully it was a helpful conversation. Um, but so I think a couple things to, to recognize is, is first, this is an investment and there's a comfort level in how you run your staff meetings for everybody involved. So one of the things I was saying is, is and there are, there are hopefully little tips, we'll continue to share them, but I'm just gonna deep dive into one kind of elements of tips. So for instance, this was their first version of highlights. One of the things that Jason did well, and in fact, I think we, I've shifted in some ways uh, my recommendation on it based on Jason's experience. Jason started in a good decision. He's kind of like what I was, almost the traffic cop to the boss, you know, in the meeting. Is that fair? Absolutely. So he's kind of responsible for organizing the staff meeting, making sure everything's on point. A key decision that he made, which is a good one, is he was the first one to do noteworthy events. And that was a good job. I think the second one, he went to what I re recommended, yeah. starting to do a junior officer. Do the, like it, it eventually in the development stage is helpful to, for collaboration purposes to have one of the newer people on your team to organize the buzz because they have to meet with different department heads and other team members to, to collect that. Not a good idea in the first step. In the first step, I think it's important as somebody that feels kind of ownership around that meeting to start to designate what is noteworthy and what is not. So for instance, this was one of the is not is this is all their kind of teams in there. He felt in the beginning, it's normal. Like not everyone needs, has something noteworthy. You don't need to highlight everybody. In fact, I would have a point of view early on. What is noteworthy in the command? Have your own point of view and then challenge you with others to, to you know, to, to not only give you feedback, but to, I'm saying to go to the department. If I thought, for instance, I'm going to make one up here. Um, so for instance, the admin at the end of the year awards, the collection is complete, right? I'm going to make this up. I don't know the details. I just took a quick look at that and I'd be like, you know what? That might be interesting. People put in awards. I want to know as it is kind of probably as a team, what are the awards going to be nominated? Maybe like how many, you know, in this case is the collection, how many awards were collected, responses collected. Yeah, expect them to be put out at Christmas cards. Yeah, like something that, like that. that. Be the actual highlight something like that. Year. So I might go out in this case here to the admin because one of the parts that's hard as, as the traffic cop, hard as the initial person, is when most people are comfortable only informing the boss, their mindset is on what do I need to get the boss's permission on? 
versus what's actually relevant information to the rest of the community. They're just not thinking like that. So what I might recommend on this is to go to the admin person and say, you know, I think these end of the words are noteworthy. You, you know, come back to me with what you think are noteworthy elements for the team. See their first pass. If it comes back where it's like, you know, end awards are, you know, collections complete. I might say, come on, like, you know, we'll, we'll, here are questions that I would have as a part of the community. Can you give me some talking points on that? Right. So, and as you start to do it, you can then end the first session, the second session. Hopefully people start to say, wait a minute, the admin person got some buzz on there, some highlights. Well, why can't I get some buzz? You want to start to change that in so that, but if you hold up, pretty good standard at, at the beginning of what's noteworthy, but I wouldn't underestimate people aren't in the mindset because they're in the mindset to communicate to the boss, not the community. Right. So those are just some tips on, uh, I, I don't have a slide up here. This is some highlight, we'll, we'll give this to you of kind of what good looks like. And um, the other parts in the showcase, we were having this conversation. You'll find when you start to do innovation, it's easy to pick the first couple. Right, and the first couple you'll find like everyone kind of knows it's like it's easy to do. So the, the actual the first couple in showcase, you, you'll do, what I've seen in other groups that have done this is you'll find the initial part is well received. People actually really want. There's a pent up hunger to hear new things and innovations that are going on. Like people like when they talk about it with their colleagues, they will implement that down. But here's the hard part from the boss's standpoint or the traffic cop standpoint. It's easy to know the first two, but then it feels like pulling teeth. Because it's scary, people don't want to go up there if it's not really innovative. So part of this and the way there's a sequence into this is the handpicking in the beginning, recognizing that, get your key leaders early in the process and saying, we want to highlight our innovation in the group. And I want you to start thinking about it. You'll see for the first two to three that like I, I've kind of selected, but I need your nominations early on of, because you can start to give people heads up. You got two weeks, you got one week, I've nominated you. I want you to kick ass in the staff meeting, right? Once you get to development, you don't need to handhold them and make sure everything looks good. In fact, just the innovation, you'll start to see over time, a bunch of feedback, it, there's so much more they could do, is better than a perfect polish where they just get good job. That's later on. So for instance, one of the things I was saying to Jason was, he runs a department head meeting that's about 25 to 30 people. So in the beginning, maybe pick innovation, but ultimately innovation could happen anywhere within the community, in the team. And in fact, if you see someone that's a, you know, a more maybe it's a junior officer, or maybe it's an, you know, enlisted, that's doing something innovative, it might be a process, it might be a, you know, a, a little thing that they did, that you can have them come as a guest speaker in the meeting, sit in on it, if, if there's, you know, there's stuff you don't want them to know in the meet, fine, but just have them come at the end. But it's recognition for them, it will spread virally to others. And what you'll start to build a brand of is as a leadership team, we want an innovation, we have uh, expectation of it, and we will highlight that so you get, we'll get to the feedback part, feedback so that innovation goes even further. Um, and so, uh, I recognize that we've, we started late, we've gone a little bit over. Um, Can I ask a question yep. about the, the meat part? Um, how do you drag, so do you just show, uh, show information there or do you generate discussions there? How is that being, it's, or just people it, yeah, give it's, feedback? It's a, it's a pretty formal, um, okay. so for instance, uh, you know, I, I, it, 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 so for instance, I'll just use like the, the business one update. That's our core business. So we have you know, leaders in the US update and the UK update. In general, what we say is when the results are going well and you're hitting goals, you can feel free to start you know, going one level down to leaders to practice it. The results aren't going well, we wanna see the senior leaders be the ones in the, in the, in the, in the line. line. <laughs> Having said that, there's a pretty, it's about a three to four update. So it's, mm -hmm. you see that, you know, you'll have your versions of it, whatever it's like their goals, they're the metrics and the results. We have a qualitative update. So a qualitative update of what, you know, we call it highlights and lowlights for the week. Um, the, the, the leaders have decisions of you know, yeah. what they put in there. Um, and then usually they'll have a page or two. We try to restrict it not to, 
that just maybe it's an up, update on a top initiative or it might be a key decision that they've made. Um, and so then again, you can see there in mind when we end it that you know everybody that spoke that gets, is a speaker can get feedback. And so you can see in here, uh, I spoke on ME21 on the leadership side. I got one, three, two, three twos, and four ones. So I got eight pieces of feedback that Tom and I can look at afterwards. And the meat of your meeting, approximate amount of time? Um, I would say half hour. Okay. Yeah. So roughly, and then keep it to an hour. The whole so time. it's very education oriented. So this is well, where it's. Um, I, I would say to start with, um, like adding the end, adding the bookends, adding mm -hmm. the highlights and, and, and showcases. You know, pretty much anyone can do that. It does take effort though. To, to Greg's point, it doesn't in Jason's experience, it doesn't happen automatically. <laughs> uh, but the meat, I think we advise kind of leave it. You already have something that's happening. Like mm. don't get rid of it. Yeah. Um, but start tuning the dial. And I like the language that John Rendazzo said in the meeting earlier that um, he used to have it where everyone just, the pattern was kind of update by default. Now he switched it to brief by exception. Brief by exception. So I, I think if you think about, which is where I'll maybe leave you, going back to the first point, if, if you think about it is how to be deliberate with your meetings. What information is relevant? What information in many ways could be done at a more tactical level or update? What's worth kind of showcasing? What are the key decisions that you know the boss needs to be informed to go out for it? So, so there's lots of this, but but from this kind of dial side. So in that meet, I think it's allowed us. You saw in the very beginning, we had seven department heads. You know that was really our kind of inspection. We use that in some ways as a hammer to kind of inspect them for that. Um, so you know this kind of format has really allowed us in some ways, you know, to get to the kind of the essence. If we feel there's a big uh, um, elephant in the room in the company, like a big important topic that's like, you know, we feel is wasting kind of energy, it might come up for you, it might come up from leadership, it might come up in a variety of different ways. Um, then we'll inject there, you know, some person on the strategy group, Charlie, Megan, others into that meet to, you know, talk about that issue. That. Mm -hmm. And how much discussion, if any, is going on in the There's discussion? none. There's none. There's no discussion. Because yeah. that's There's again, no discussion. being drilled down now, again, to tactical meetings. That we're I say that because that's, you know, a 100-plus person meeting. In our team business two meeting, one of the things we do is, we, we, the, you know, it's smaller. It's 25 people, let alone, you know, depending on things to be smaller. Depending on situational and timing, we'll open up for questions. So we'll go through the results or whatever, ask questions. We do a Q&A after the weekly buzz. And it, some of the best discussion is, you know, someone will have an update and someone will ask kind of question. So, uh, but the, I, I, I would just refine one thing. It's not that uh, there's no, in a large meeting, there's no discussion, but that is how, and that, that's why we invented and why we use the feedback right. because it so allows a large group of people to give, you know, you kind of have the group sentiment done. Well, let's just present it. But in those smaller meetings then, how are you, Avoiding the silence, like when you invite the questions yeah, so, so and the feedback, in, in, like in our in our immediate team meeting, yeah, which ranges from you know ten ish to let's say twenty people. Uh, after Buzz, for example, we'll stop and we'll talk about it. Like it's just we just run it more naturally that okay. pe people speak up. It, one of the things I would I would say in small meetings that uh, this is, I don't want to get off topic, so uh, maybe we'll hold that. We'll, we'll come back to that New York or, or any kind of questions. Thoughts? Craig, I know you teed up and you had three kind of meetings on, on, on your mind. Is this, uh, you know, I'm curious from your vantage point, kind of. Yeah, I, I've, uh, you, so your buzz uh, feed there and, and uh, the way you've done that, absolutely striking a chord with me about bringing these two disparate geographic locations together at the start of the week. I think that could be really powerful. So I really like that model. Um, uh, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah, well, you, you know what's interesting about that is because we have one of our challenges. We have Boston, we have San Francisco, we have London, we have New York. So on one hand, who, who's going to read, you know, Cornelia, as you'll see it today, it's our weekly recognition. Who's going to read an update if they email? You wouldn't even think about an update in Cornelia's. But we all run our own offices at Cornita's, so they see something in the UK that may be, to this point, without us saying it or having to play middle management, you know, someone that runs our, that weekly event in Boston sees that or like, huh, 
like maybe I'll try that. Um, so, you know, I, I, to your point, I think one of the things that we have found, and again, it takes an investment. Early on, you're gonna, so here are the challenges. You're gonna get pushback from the team on wanting to do extra work. They won't like that. Two, the comfort level of like, both from the boss standpoint and the team standpoint of the typical dynamic of wanting FaceTime. So for instance, when we moved, we had seven department heads updating, you know, every week. Now we go to really the kind of the top two and we just have a showcase. Granted, that was a transition, but there was a, you know, an uncomfortableness from like the person that ran the vendor man, you know, team. Like they may not have liked it, but like they had, you know, kind of FaceTime in some ways with the boss on that update. Uh, and now all of a sudden it was in a different format. So there are always trade-offs, um, but I think the one part is to kind of recognize and acknowledge what some of those trade-offs are, um, along with the context that you're giving for why changing is helpful. You know, uh, to, speaking to, to that theme of driving kind of cohesiveness between different geographic locations, a lot of what we do in the meet, for example, in business two, we'll bring up, here's kind of our results, the status, but then we'll bring up basically our intention of what to do about it. You know, there's a problem, we, we're, you know, trying to think of one. How to best effectively teach how to run a staff meeting, right? And we will present our plan to, to the group. And, you know, this is our intention of what to do. And it's, been, it's super powerful to get feedback back from everyone because it does refine our thinking. But the fact that everyone is, the fact that everyone's able to contribute to what are core strategic problems and kind of be part of that process, that's, that's driven a, a level of engagement or even like newer employees, I think are, they're very up on what is the whole organization thinking about. So appreciate going over time for, for help. Uh, for those in, in New York, I'm just Greg at nextjob.com. If you have any follow up questions uh, or things like this, we're, we're gonna be putting all our collateral up um, on this uh, and coming up online as well. Um, but uh, you know, thanks for your, for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you guys.